Well, it is, again, the counting down towards Pesach, the, the time of the Passover, uh, which we commemorate and remember uh, each year. And the beautiful thing about um, is our celebration of Pesach is, uh, it is not just remembering the, the glory of God in bringing us out of Egypt in the flesh, but the glory of God in bringing us out of Egypt in the spirit, which is the true and the deepest of, of all the meanings. Uh, when Messiah came and walked this earth and the Pharisees said, you know, what are you doing you know, if you're the Messiah? His disciples said, what are you doing sometimes if you're the Messiah? Essentially, they were saying, why aren't you freeing us from the Romans? The Romans were simply, a, again, a type of Egypt uh, in representing the oppression and the occupation uh, of being held hostage. When, when you think of um, an, uh, being occupied in, in, a, in, in the sense that they were, what are some of the feelings you think our people may have felt? Anger, okay. Depression. Depression. Bitterness. Say again. Slavery. Slavery. Bitterness. Bitterness. Have all the things which are present um, in, in the people who, who are not free from sin. Um, unbelievers don't know the peace of Messiah. And you can't tell them about the peace. Well, you can. But you can't tell, you, they can't experience it until they've tasted it. And truly, uh, to be set free from the bondage of sin is so much greater than the bondage of a man under the occupation. The people who have not come to faith in Messiah are living in an occupied state of sin, which is a, a very, very, very desperate thing to be in that place. We're looking at uh, the various uh, portions of the ministry of Messiah while he walked upon this earth as we kind of lead up towards uh, Passover. If you turn over to the Gospel of Matthew... Matthew 20, 21. Our God uh, teaches in stories. Uh, the Bible itself is a collection of, of the stories. But he teaches us in, in, in teaching stories uh, called parables. And there's many other ways to describe it. Bless you. The, the stories are, are deeper than just the words that are there. Does that make sense? Uh, when you look at the words behind the words, then you understand the meaning of the story. And so you can, you can know the story itself and go, oh, that was a nice story. But the story that is behind that is something that is, again, of the utmost importance. Chapter 21 and verse 28. It says the parable of the two sons. So, again, interesting. But what do you think? A man who had two sons, and he came to the first and said, son, go to work in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. And likewise, to the second son, he said, uh, likewise, he answered and said, I will go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? And they said to him, the first. Yeshua said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For Yochanan, John, came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So what is, what is the, this, this parable? It says uh, one son that says, uh, no, I'm not going to do it. But then he actually does it. Okay, actions speak louder than words. Okay, louder than words. Uh, the other son says, oh yeah, I'll do it. Nada, nothing happens. Okay, so obedience is not in, in words alone. It's not in a confession of the mouth, but in the deeds and actions. And then Messiah takes it even further than just the actions. He says, what is in your heart also takes precedence. And he was speaking this to who? Uh, Samaritans? Who is he speaking this to? And? And the Pharisees, the leaders of the people that were around him. They were hearing this. Huh. Let's see. And I bet you wonder, the, the, or I bet you they were wondering, hmm. See, he's teaching stories. Which one am I? The one who said, no, I won't do it, i.e. keeping the commandments, and then actually did it? Or, the one, or am I the one that said, yeah, I'll do it, but nothing? Which one do you think they were? The second one. They 
Read yourself into the story. Don't just look at it as, oh, those, those like nagging Pharisees, they just kind of never got it. Read yourself into the story and ask yourself, which one am I? Truth be told, we're both. For we say, yes, I will keep your commandments, O God, and then we don't do it. But Hashem, we rise into Shuva and we rise once again, and we say, yes, Lord, I will do it, and we do. And there are times when we say, uh, no, no, I, I won't do it. But then we begin to obey the commandments. It's not a one and done deal. It's not a thing in the past. It's every day, every breath. Where will you be found standing or sitting or upon the ground when he comes for you? Yes. So, not only the outward actions, but also the inwards. Not, also, not that which we can say. It's why Yeshua says, even if you've done everything that you should have done, even if you kept all the commandments perfectly, you should say, we are unprofitable servants because we only did that which we were told to do. Where is the servant that rises above and does above and beyond? And those are fulfilling the spiritual aspects of the words. Not those who simply follow the letter, spiritual things that are behind these things. Again, a beautiful um, example. When we say uh, a measurement, uh, we measure ourselves by these, you could say. The truth is that we should never say, yeah, I got this down. We should, we should look at this as a healing manual to say, God, I can't even begin to know what I am. Oh, Lord, you show me in your mercy. He says in verse 33, here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it and, and uh, dug a wine press in and built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers and went into a far country. And when vintage time came, or the time of the harvest, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive uh, its, its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. And he sent other servants uh, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. And when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And so they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? He was telling them, not just a story, but he wove in a part of scripture into it because he knew as soon as he began this parable, as soon as he got to a certain point, they would know of what he was speaking about. Hold your place, if you would, and then turn over to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5. In verse 1. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 1. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved Regarding his vineyard, my well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted in it the choicest vine. And he built a tower in its midst and he made a winepress in it. So he expected to bring forth good grapes, but he, it brought forth wild or sour or undesirable grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected to bring it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned. I shall break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned or dug. There shall come up briars and thorns, and I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. They knew what he was referring to. They knew at that point who he was talking to, and it dug them in two. But yet they had to quote the scripture. Back to, to Matthew. In verse 40, 
It says, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? And they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. And Yeshua said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? For this is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing fruits, bearing the fruits of it. And whosoever falls upon this stone will be broken, and whoever, uh, on, on whomever it falls, it will grind him into a powder. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his pale, parable, they perceived that he was speaking of them. They sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the multitudes, because they took him to be a prophet. Ouch. So when Yeshua did all these miracles, and he did all the various things, and they were checking off mentally. Hmm. Heals the sick. Sight to the blind. Casts forth a demon from a dumb person who can't speak to tell the name of the demon. And they say, oh, man, he's getting dangerously close to uh, being the Messiah. And they sought what to, to do to him. Did they say, oh my God, Thank you, the time has come. Thank you, God, for sending the Messiah. Did they say that? What were they trying to protect? Okay, loss of power and control, prestige, position. God have mercy on us. Uh, we could be found among them if we take our eyes off of the one whom we serve. It's never about those things. It's never about what we can see and, and taste and touch. It's about who do you serve. If God were to appear today, who would recognize him? If Yeshua walked into a, a place of worship that bears the sign of the cross, would they recognize him? Or would he be politically incorrect? Would he represent what they have made him to be in their own minds? Is he real and authentic in our minds? Or have we created a God in our own image? May it not be so. When he speaks of the vineyard, um, what is he speaking of? Okay. okay. Um, in this particular parable, he speaks of the vineyard as Jerusalem. Uh, and the tower which was built, what, what is that? The temple? Yep. And when he speaks of these things, he's, he's, giving, he's giving an understanding of it. He be, they begin to say, hmm, wait a minute. He's referring to the prophet Isaiah. Uh, he's referring to something, and it, it dawns on them that, wait a minute, he's applying this to you and to me, Moshe. What? Who is he? I'm not held in bondage by all of these things as, as I sit in, 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 in clothed in comfort and, and concerned about worldly things. No, I'm not in bondage. If they recognized they were in bondage, they weren't willing to be released from it. If they recognized that they were in bondage, the things of the world crowded out their hearts and held it tight with, with the thorns and the thistles. When he is speaking of the hedge, that the hedge would be removed or destroyed. He's speaking of the Torah, which is the fiery wall which protected Israel against the influences of the nations. Do you realize that when God called the Jewish people out of the world and he gave them a, um, a code of, of laws, it wasn't so they could go, yep, here we are keeping laws. He set them apart and he gave them the foundation for which most free countries in this, well, relatively free countries, in this nation, uh, sorry, in this world operate on today. He set in, in motion health practices which would separate them from the nations and they wouldn't get sick because he knew, God knows, his creation. And he said, I want to protect you and give you all the things that you, not only the physical practices, but the spiritual practices. He gave us these things. He gives us commandments because he loves us. And when we obey them, we, we, we experience the blessings. 
um, when um, he, he gave us those things, he was teaching us both physical, practical things, but also deep spiritual things. And it was that such that when, uh, when was the tower destroyed? It was the temple. So roughly 35 years later, after Messiah passes and uh, is ascending to heaven, uh, the tower, uh, which is described in the parable, is, is destroyed. Um, it says in, in the prophet Isaiah and, and here in his words that the walls itself would, would be destroyed. Did that happen? To Jerusalem? It was leveled. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I longed to gather you like a mother gathers her little ones. But you would not hear me. So he says that not one stone will be left upon another. And so it was. And when he speaks of the, the vineyard, he also speaks of the vine dressers. Um, and he, he talks to, to, the, to the servants that in the, in the parable were sent to the vineyard. And, and who, were, who were those servants? Okay, messengers, um, prophets. Um, what's that? Believers. Okay. Um, it was the prophets. Isaiah was one of them. Uh, Jeremiah. Um, each of the prophets were sent to, and many times, um, they, were, they were murdered by our people. Uh, they didn't want to hear it. But in, in all ages, there's always been a remnant who shema Israel, who hear and then do. Uh, be you not hearers of the word, but also doers of the Torah. And so we see that in this parable, he, he, he's, he's telling them, uh, you, he was speaking to the Pharisees, and he said to the Pharisees, your fathers murdered the prophets. How do you think that made them feel? Um, did you think that made them feel, feel validated? Do you think that that made them feel affirmed that, oh my gosh, you're right, Our, my fathers did kill the prophets? Wait a minute. We, we, we proclaim the prophets, but in reality, we don't do what the prophets have said. We may fulfill some of the outer things that the prophets said to do, which was to you know, repent and turn back to, to God. And even the, even the, uh, the rich young man said, I do all the things that, I should do. He, he did all of the, of the things that, well, in his mind at least, that the Torah said to do. He loved God. He worshipped God. He loved people. He, you know, he did all the right things. He tithed. He did all the, all the things that were supposed to be doing. He did, he did those things. But Yeshua said one thing to him because he looked deep into his soul and said, okay, I see you do that. But now walk away from your wealth and give it to the poor and come follow me. And the rich young man said, mm, wow. Follow the Messiah and give up my wealth or hold on to my wealth. And he chose the wealth rather than to walk in the way of God. Um, no one can say, oh, I'm a member of this church or that church, and I do this, and I go here on Sunday or Wednesday or Saturday or wherever, and, and I'm good. It's about the follow-through. At no point in our lives can we ever say, God, I've done everything you wanted me to. Um, you know what? I'm just going to take a minute here and uh, relax and say to my soul, soul? You've laid up many, many goods for yourself. Uh, you know what? You deserve to take a little break here and kick back. Uh, slippery slope downwards. God have mercy upon us. We see that this is a parable that's not for the past, but for the present. It is for those of us who have ears to hear. What do you think would have changed had the chief priests and the Pharisees, had they truly Shema? What do you think would have happened had they listened and said, here is the Messiah? History would be different today, wouldn't it? 
the Pharisees were the were the were, were the the leaders of the people. They weren't uh, of the tribe of Levi. They were they were of every other tribe, and they were those that were. According to the Torah, they, they, they formulated hedges and, and fences and, and practices and things which allowed the average day Israelite to function in, in society in an occupied nation to be able to strive to keep the Torah. And that is a noble thing. And that was good. And there were many. And many of those righteous Pharisees became believers when they heard his words or the words of the apostles at some point. But those that trusted in those things missed God or they held too tightly to their wealth. Chapter 22, parable of the wedding feast. And Yeshua answered, in 20, chapter 22 of Matthew in verse 1, Yeshua answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call, uh, call those who were invited to the wedding, but they were not willing to come. So he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my, my dinner. My oxen and the fatted calf, uh, sorry, fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went about their ways, and each to his own farm, and to his own business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. And when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. And he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Do you think that they knew who, who, they were who, who he was talking about? They had perhaps no idea that Jerusalem would eventually be burned and fall. The walls were, turned, were, were, were brought down, and the Romans burned Jerusalem. They charred it, and it was terrible. Uh, the servants that God sends out, what, were the, what was the message of the prophets? Repent. Okay, repent. Okay, return. Uh, Shuv, turn to me, O Israel. That's the message of the prophets. It's not, um, I hate you and I'm going to destroy you. Um, that's, that's madness. God is love. And it's his love which drives his servants, the prophets, to teach us you know, God loves you. He wants you to not be hurt. He wants you to be strong and walk in, in his mercy. Return to me, O Israel, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. And this is the message of the prophets, and yet our people, probably some of our relatives somewhere back there, killed the prophets because they would not listen. It says, continuing in verse 8, that he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways and invite as many as you can and find to invite the to the wedding. Again, who's he referring to? He's referring to everybody outside of Israel. Uh, he's referring to primarily the Gentiles. He's referring to uh, the Jews, the, the small portion of Jews that would accept him as he sent the apostles out into those places wherever our people were. He was speaking primarily of the Gentiles, the people who are not of a Jewish origin. But they would hear the message and they would do what God asked. It says that, so uh, in verse 10, so the servants went out into the highways and gathered together whom they found, both good, uh, bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Okay, so it's an interesting description of a wedding feast. It's probably not described anywhere else. A wedding feast. And he gathered the good and the bad. Uh, we'll just assume that the ugly were not there. He, he said that there was the good and the bad. And this is interesting. Interesting notation. And it says in verse 11 that when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment on. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here? And how did you come to be without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. The king said to his servant, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness for where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The wedding feast, is, again, is described in a very particular way in this. It, this is an eschatological showing of, of a time to come. But it also happens every day. When people pass from this earth, 
And they present themselves before the king in that time. And they say, here I am, God. Went to church every Sunday. Went to Shabbat services every Saturday. Did all the, all the good stuff that you, that you told me to do, God. Here I am. And the master looks at them and says, uh, did you invite him? Because I don't see his name on the list here. And anybody that finds those words from the master is found speechless. The beautiful, or I guess the, the thing to see is, in that wedding feast, there were three kinds of people. What was the first kind? What's that? Okay. I'm thinking um, how they were clothed and, and, and when they were clothed. Okay. Um, in order to be present, you had to have something. What was that? Okay, a wedding garment. Okay. And then there were those that had the wedding garment, but they, they gained it later. And then there was those that, that, that found themselves there, but they didn't have the wedding garment. Um, you've heard it said that when someone comes to uh, faith late in life, or maybe at the last breath, and there are, they come to repentance, true repentance, and they come to faith, and that person is a believer for a day or an hour or a few minutes. And you say to yourself, how, how is that possible? God it does not judge how we judge. And time is of no relevance in the sense of how he looks at things. <clears throat> While we are living as believers, does God say, you've got your wedding garment, so you're good? Or what does he say for us to do? Okay, louder. I mean, I actually have to do something? Uh, wouldn't it be nice if you could wear your, your clothes and then never get dirty? Can you imagine never doing laundry? Wow. The Israel just got that advantage for 40 years and they're good. Yeah, their clothes didn't wear out. Uh, yeah, but they, but, but, they, but they still had to wash their, their clothes. When they got to the mountain to hear the, the Ten Commandments, what would God tell them to do? To wash their garments. To cleanse their garments. He was showing a physical, consistent re reality for something that is of spiritual nature. To understand this parable, it is important to understand um, Eastern culture. Those that were able to came clothed in, in a rich garment because they had done something previously to be able to have that garment. But there were those that were not able to afford or have that garment. And so the king had at the doorways um, servants that would, that would give them a wedding garment. And so for this man who to be able to get into the, the place, he had to do what? He had either sneaked in or he, he, he had he'd refused the garment that was offered him. And here's the three kinds. Believers who have lived whatever period of time, who have fallen and repented and rose and have washed their garments and have prepared a beautiful garment of the soul. Or are those that come to faith later in life, maybe at the last minute, like the thief on the cross, who are given a garment out of the mercy of the king. Only a madman would turn away a gift that is eternal. Only a madman would turn away love. And yet this example, by that man being in the wedding feast without a garment, he was, he was like spurning God and saying, I want what you have, but I'm not willing to do what you have told me to do. His disdainment and his depravity is what was present. Nobody gets anything over on God. None of us can. And so he tells us in this parable that we must be those that are constantly preparing this garment. Um, can you imagine that in the parable also of, of, of the bridegroom? If, if the bride simply said, yeah, I, I know the bridegroom's coming, but I'm just going to hang out and, you know, just going to do my own stuff. Um, or what, what does the wise bride do every single night? 
Okay, trims the wick of, of the lamp and, light, and lights it. Yep. And, and lo- watch, is watchful and looks in hopefulness. That is called sobriety. That is called watchfulness. It is an awareness, a clarity of mind to know that when he comes, will you be ready, O bride? The wedding garment is the proper spiritual condition of the soul. Yes. Yes. You see, forgiveness of sins does not remove the, the corruption of the passions within us. We repent of a sin is something that's out here or, or, or here, but it doesn't remove the wound. And this is the journey of believers, is the healing of the wounds, the, of the passions, so that they will become virtues and, and God-like. You can't do anything to make God love you more. Your actions, righteous deeds will not make God love you anymore. But your righteous deeds and proper actions and humility will make you more like God. And this is the difference. Faith is action and deeds. But they're not to earn God's love. They're to transform you and me more and more like his likeness. So we must struggle and not lose heart, but repent and be bold. And yet, he says, a broken and humble heart that God will not despise. An elder said, live in such a way that God, the God of love will love you with eternal love and go forth to your work, but watch, so as not to sell your soul to the world through the acquisition of worldly goods. Go forth into your fields and fertilize your land and sow seed in it so that with its fruit you may strengthen your body, but especially sow the fruits of eternal life in the field. Preserve the garment received in holy baptism pure and spotless until the end of your life, that you may be a worthy partaker of the heavenly bridal chamber, where in only those who enter who have a pure garment and burning lamps in their hands will be found. He says in, in the Revelation, which we won't take a, a minute to do it, but Revelation twenty two fourteen, that they washed their garments who were ready. It's this constant reference to the garment, and, and the garment is, is the soul that we have been given. And in the process of, of journeying from baptism until the passing from this earth is this process of the purification of those things. May we wash our garments each day with repentance and tears and mercy and right deeds towards others. May we forgive others that we be forgiven and wash the garments of our souls with purifying repentance that we may humbly stand before the King on that day and say, O my Lord, I have tried with my actions to be faithful to your service, but I have not done everything that you asked. And the King will say, Speak on, what have you done with the talents that I have given you? O my King, you know, but I have taken the two gifts and have only been able to produce one more. I see all as you know, says the king, and you speak truly, but when you say that you have produced one more, and we might fall before the king and say, please have mercy on me, O blessed one. May he say to us at that time, rise and let me show you a mystery. Truly you did produce one more, yet there were others that you were not aware of, which is the mark of a humble man. For a humble man does not see much of the results of their actions because they're fixed on me. They take pleasure in loving me, that they do not see or rejoice over their own accomplishments. And let me show you the garden of the fruit trees that you have produced in me. And indeed, the garden was vast and beautiful and full of every good fruit of all the shining virtues. Let us therefore do the deeds of the commandments with faith and hope and love, that God may be glorified that we may offer up to him a sweet sacrifice so that he may say, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen.